Hello chemists, this is Ms. Placino and you are watching screencast 12.3, Strengths of Acids and Bases. Um, in this lesson we're going to talk about how to determine the H plus ion concentration in an acid. And it turns out it really hinges on the idea um, of is it a strong or weak acid that you are dealing with. So we'll talk about how to figure that out. All right, let's get started. Okay, um, so I've got a quick video to show you. HX is supposed to represent some sort of essentially ionically bonded um, substance. And we're going to take HX and we're going to dissolve it in water. We'll wait and see what happens. Ooh, oh, it's breaking apart into H plus and X minus, and then it's turning into H3O pluses. The water is grabbing um, the hydrogen to make hydronium. And now we are floating around in solution. Look at that. That looks like fun. Nice. How much HX do we have left? Mm, looks like none. Looks like all of our HX turned into H3O plus and X minus. When this happens, this means that you are looking or working with a strong acid. Strong acids dissociate completely. Common misconception is that strong acids are always the most dangerous, hazardous compounds. They can be, but that's not what makes something a strong acid. Strong acids are just um, substances that when dissolved in water, you get entirely ions, specifically H plus, and then some anion. And we can represent this with a forward reaction only. There's really no reverse reaction. If the H plus and the X minus run into each other, they might reform HX for a split second, but they're just going to break apart again. So we say it's forward reaction only. We produce all ions. Let's look at the next example. Kind of funny. I'm going to take HA. We're going to try dissolving this in water and see what happens. It's starting to break apart. I have a lot of HAs just floating around in solution. Some of them have gone ahead and formed H3O pluses and A minuses, but a lot of them just stay as HA. In this case, we don't have full dissociation. We have partial dissociation. And that is the hallmark of a weak acid. Weak acids dissociate to a much lesser extent than a strong acid. Uh, weak acids exist at equilibrium. I have both a forward reaction, where H plus and A minus are produced by the dissociation of HA, and I've got the reverse reaction. H plus and A minus can recombine and reform HA. So in this little, I guess it's technically a video that you just saw, um, once the H3O plus and A minus were formed, they just kind of stayed there. But in reality, this is an equilibrium system. Sometimes they're going to collide and reform HA. And that would mean that another molecule of HA would be able to dissociate and break apart. So the strength of acids and bases, for that matter, depend on the extent of, of dissociation. Strong acids and strong bases dissociate completely. They produce all ions, and there is none of the original substance left. Weak acids and weak bases only dissociate partially. You end up with a lot of your original material, in this case, HA, you have some ions floating around in solution, but to a much lesser extent. This is a reversible reaction. So just a little note about strong and weak bases. Strong bases tend to be our ionic compounds. We've got our hydroxides. Our group 1 metals are super, super soluble. So we're able to dissolve sodium hydroxide in water and end up with all ions. Our weak bases tend to be bronze stud bases, bronze stud lorry bases. Um, and if you remember from the previous lesson, we're able to produce hydroxide usually by having our base um, just behaving as a proton acceptor. Um, so in this case, water is going to donate one of its protons to NH3. We'll make NH4 plus and hydroxide that way. I'm sure the suspense is killing you. You want to know what the seven strong acids and seven strong bases are. Well, here you go. Strong acids, HI, HBr, HCl. These are easy to remember because they're in group 17. Do not throw HF in that mix. True. 
Hydrofluoric acid is an extremely nasty chemical. Those of you who watch Breaking Bad know what I'm talking about. It's not considered a strong acid. Why not? Because it doesn't dissociate completely. We also have H2SO4, sulfuric. HNO3, nitric. HClO4, perchloric. And ClO3, chloric. These are a little bit more difficult to remember, but at least keep in mind that they're all polyatomics, and they're all threes and fours, lots of oxygen involved here. Um, so you're going to have to come up with your own little trick to remember these. Uh, depending on what resource you're using, different textbooks might only have six strong acids or five strong acids. We're going to go with all seven of them. So we've got hydroiodic, hydrobromic, hydrochloric, sulfuric, nitric, perchloric, and chloric. And you're probably wondering, how am I going to remember all these? And the answer is simple, repetition. I really, really recommend, at least for the next couple of days, take a piece of scrap paper, see if you can write down the seven strong acids. The reason I'm asking you to memorize these is because we build on this concept in later lessons. And if you don't know your strong acids, you're not going to be able to predict the endpoint of a titration. You're not going to be able to pick an indicator. You're not going to be able to determine the um, pH of a salt. So it's really, really important that you've got these seven. I personally think the strong bases are easier to remember because they're kind of clumped in the same area of the periodic table. We have calcium hydroxide, strontium hydroxide, and barium hydroxide. These are all group two. Magnesium hydroxide is not very soluble in water so it is skipped. We also have sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, rubidium hydroxide, and cesium hydroxide. These all come from group one, minus lithium, not very soluble, and no francium hydroxide. To the best of my knowledge, that doesn't even exist. Francium is so rare. Uh, so the bases are a little bit easier for most people to remember due to the fact that they're all over on the left side of the periodic table. Again, the only way to really memorize them is to take the time to just write them down. Keep going again and again, you know, see how many you can get. Um, I know it's annoying, but that's really what you need to do. Okay. Um, hydrogen ion concentration is something that we're going to have to pay a lot of attention to so that we can calculate things like pH. When a strong acid is dissolved in water, it's going to dissociate 100%. Just like in that little video clip we saw, we're going to make all ions. So if I have HCl, one of our seven strong acids, it's going to dissociate into all H plus and Cl minus ions. So if I start off with 0 0.50 molar HCl, what concentration of H plus ions will I have? Well, if we look at the ratio, we have one to one to one. Now the chloride really matters in this case. Every time one HCl breaks apart, I'll make one hydrogen ion, one chloride ion. So if I have 0.5 molar to keep that ratio constant, I'll have a concentration of 0.5 molar hydrogen and also 0.50 molar chloride. But again, we're not too concerned with that. So strong acids, it's easy, especially when they're monoprotic one proton. They are going to dissociate completely and the concentration of the acid is going to be equal to the concentration of the H plus ion. Same thing goes for strong bases, but of course we'll be looking at the hydroxide ion. When a weak acid dissociates, we have to calculate something called Ka. Uh, Ka is the equilibrium constant for an acid. And you might cringe a little when you hear equilibrium constant. I know that, that can be a difficult topic for people, uh, but we're going to revisit it. And hopefully now that we're doing it again, it's going to be a little bit easier. We know, <coughs> whoa, crazy dog. <coughs> oh, Cooper, man, it is hard to believe he's only 20 pounds. Sorry, as I was saying, when we have a weak acid dissociating, um, it doesn't dissociate 100%. Concentration of hydrogen ions produced depends on the value of Ka. This is just the equilibrium constant for an acid. And you can kind of think about this as a way to gauge how far does the forward reaction take place. Um, to review, 
we know that a k expression, whether it's k a, you might imagine k b for bases, k e q, which we talked about in the kinetics and equilibrium unit, is still the concentration of your products divided by the concentration of your reactants. And if you have exponents, sorry, coefficients, they're going to turn into exponents. Uh, we catch a break with acids. Uh, acids tend to dissociate just one hydrogen ion at a time. Uh, so you don't have to worry about having um, you know, exponents up here. That never, ever happens for an acid. We're going to include all of the substances. They're all aqueous. Um, so their concentrations are going to change over time. So if you have a concentration of hydrofluoric acid of 0.5 molar, what is the concentration of H plus ions in the solution going to be? This was easy when you're talking about a strong acid. That one-to-one -one ratio, you know, make all ions, so it would be 0.5 molar. We're dealing with a weak acid. So hopefully, without doing any math, you can at least conclude that the concentration of H plus ions is going to be less than the concentration of the acid itself. The value of Ka is small. It's really small. Um, and if we think back to what we learned about Ka, if Ka is less than 1, um, that means that the reverse reaction is favored. So we're going to have still mostly HF in solution and very few H plus and F minus ions floating around. This is a little bit of an advanced topic, but we'll try it out. We're going to make something called a rice chart. Rice is reaction, initial concentration, change in concentration, and then the end or ending concentration. So I've got my reaction, and I've got everything broken up into columns. Initially, when you first put the HF in the water, you have a concentration of 0.5 molar HF, and you don't have any of your ions produced just yet. Once dissolved, we know the HF is going to start to break apart, at least some of the HF molecules. So are we going to see an, uh, an increase in the concentration of HF or a decrease? Well, it's going to be breaking apart to make ions, so that's going to lower the concentration. By how much, we don't know. But we know we're going to be subtracting some amount. Every time one HF breaks apart, we make one H plus and one F minus. They're going to be present in the same ratio, so equal quantities or equal concentrations. So that means when it's all said and done, the concentration of HF is going to be 0 0.50 molar minus some amount, and the concentration of the, both the H plus and F minus ion is going to be equal to X. If you're thinking ahead, you might realize that this is going to require the quadratic equation to solve. We are not going to use the quadratic equation. Luckily, the value of x is generally so small compared to the concentration of the acid, it can be ignored. So if I was going to write my Ka expression, I'm going to have hf times f minus, so I'd have x times x, or just simply x squared. And then I'd have 0 0.50 minus x, but x is so small, I can get rid of it. And then ka was provided earlier, uh, so this is actually a number. So now I'm just solving for x squared. And when I come up with x, that's going to be equal to the concentration of the hydrogen ions and also the fluoride ions. Ooh. Uh, so let's go ahead and finish this question up. This is, uh, go ahead and be complete. So we've got Ka at 7.2 times 10 to the negative fourth. I'm going to plug that into my calculator. I get x squared is equal to 0 0.00036. If I take the square root of that, I will come up with a concentration I'll come up with my value of x, which is going to be equal to the concentration of H plus ions, and that's ultimately what I'm trying to find. I end up with 0, 0.0, we'll round it to the right number of sig figs. I see two sig figs, two sig figs. We'll go to two sig figs as well. So we'll call that 1, 9 molar. Oof. So these initially look really intimidating, uh, but when it's all said and done, it simplifies down really, really quickly. Uh, everything is going to take on the general 
format, Ka is equal to x squared over the concentration of the acid. If you decide to take AP chemistry or pursue chemistry when you get to college, uh, all of a sudden they will make it so that x actually does matter, and you're going to have to solve a quadratic. Now remember, you've got lots of tools at your disposal to do so, so it sounds much more intimidating than it actually is. But anyway, for our purposes, we will make the assumption that uh, the value of x is so small that subtracting it doesn't make a big deal. And if we look, we've got 0.5 minus 0.019. So it didn't even drop by two hundredths of a molar. Uh, so I say that's, that's pretty small, and we can ignore that. All right, guys, there are some practice problems for you to play around with. Um, this is important, as I said before. We're going to need to be able to calculate the concentration of H plus ions so that we can ultimately figure out the pH, and that's what we're going to be doing in the next lesson. Okay, thank you for tuning in. I hope you found this helpful.